If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to Mark chapter 10 with me and you'll see right now why um, having my niece come up and sing the special today, why it means so much. The title of my message this morning is, It's Okay to Let Your Inner Child Run the Place. Um, and before the husbands all get excited about that, it's not what you think that means. They're like, all right, this is going to be a good day. No, your wife is still watching. Um, it's not what you think. It, we don't just get to get in there and have all the fun. But this, uh, this message is something that is so important for us to hear as Christians. I think we would all agree that maturity is a very important part of the growing process. We would, we, I think we all agree that on that. If you've got a 30, 40 year old man acting like a two, three year old little boy, you think, okay, that's not cool. You know, maturity is an important part of the growing process. We wouldn't really like it if all the adults in the world acted like children. And I know that because every once in a while, well, we do, and it doesn't really draw a crowd. You know, like, <laughs> we, we don't really like to see that. So maturity is such an important part of the growing process. Normally, I would tell people not to behave like children. If you're not a child, then don't behave like a child. I would, I would, I would throw that piece of advice out there. But today, I want to take a different approach. I want to look at this in a totally different way. Today, I want to show you a way that, that you can let your inner child take over, and I promise you it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Go ahead and let your inner child take over. Let, let that inner child run the place for a while. It, it's a good thing. From time to time when we read the Bible, when we pick up the Bible and we, we look at the characters in the Bible, we can sympathize with, what, with what's going on in those stories. Uh, you look at Jonah, the story of Jonah, and put yourself in his shoes. Uh, we're not happy about our situation when we put ourselves in his shoes. When you see the uh, lame man healed or the blind receive sight, we can, we can share joy with that person when we put ourselves in that person's situation. In this short account, in Mark chapter 10, we can somewhat relate to the disciples in this story. And at the same time, we can see where they're in the wrong too. But we can, we can connect to them. We can relate to the disciples here. Jesus has been dealing with people all day. And now a new crowd approaches. Uh, he's been helping people. He's been working with people. Jesus healed the blind. He uh, helped the lame. He healed the lame so they could walk. He raised the dead. Um, he fed the 5,000 with five loaves, two fish. Jesus is a pretty busy guy. He does a lot of things. And now a new crowd is, shows up to Jesus. Look at Mark chapter 10 in verse 13. It says, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. We don't know everything that was going on this day. We just have this account. We don't know everything that's going on this day, but when, but when the disciples see this, they immediately run in to intervene. A bunch of kids are coming. There's a crowd of children coming up to Jesus. Parents have brought their children to Jesus so that he could bless them. And when the disciples see all of these kids coming to Jesus, they see this as a problem. Hasn't Jesus been through enough? I mean, look at all that he does. I mean, he's helping people all the time. And oh, oh great. Somebody let the kids loose. You know, <laughs> here comes a bunch of kids. And Jesus sees this, sees this, and he looks out and he sees all these children coming. Jesus' attitude about this is so much different than the disciples' attitude. The disciples say, okay, we've got a problem here. It's not like Jesus is the mall Santa where you get to bring your kid and put him on his lap and you could tell Jesus everything you want. That's not what's going on here. It's not like he's that guy. When the children start showing up, the disciples start running crowd control. They get in there. They're going to intervene. Let's go ahead and put this to a stop. Kids are coming to Jesus. Let's solve this problem. And when Jesus notices that what the disciples are doing, he starts running disciple control. The disciples are like, all right, keep the kids away from Jesus. And Jesus is like, okay, I got to work. I got to deal with the disciples now. We've, there is a problem here, but it's not the kids. It's not the kids. It's the disciples. Look at verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Just when the parents would have thought, okay, we're going to have to turn around. Uh, the disciples are telling us, go away. Jesus decides to use the whole situation to teach an important lesson about the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't skip a beat when it comes to this stuff. I want you to understand the kingdom of God so much clearer. And I'm going to use this opportunity too to teach about the kingdom of God. 
those kids suddenly became the star of the show. What the disciples thought were going, was going to be a problem, Jesus says, okay, that's the perfect illustration. Give them the mic. Go ahead. Let them sing out a little bit. Let's go ahead and make these kids the star of the show. The, the disciples got to hear parables so many times. So many illustrations throughout the three years that they spent with Jesus. They got to hear parable after parable, but this one was unique. This, this illustration that Jesus is presenting is unique. They've heard that the kingdom of God was like a sower sowing seed. They've heard that the kingdom of God was like a merchant looking for a pearl of great price. They've, they've heard these illustrations before. But this example set the stage for how a person could enter the kingdom of God. This, this isn't just describing the kingdom of God. This is how to have that relationship. This illustration is, is so much bigger than those other illustrations as far as how to enter the kingdom of God. Look at verse 15. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. If you don't come as a little child, you don't get in. That's, he says, if you don't come to the kingdom of God as a little child, you don't get in. This is an important illustration. And this doesn't mean that you have to get saved while you're a little child. That's not what, oh man, I'm an adult. I wasn't saved when I was a child. I guess I'm out. That's not what it means. He says, I want you to come to the kingdom of God as a little child. Not when you're a little child, but as a little child. This illustration is about a heart condition. This is, I want you to come with that heart right there, with that heart condition. If you still battle with doubts about whether you're saved or not, don't miss this. Please don't miss this. We are here this morning with quite a few people. You know, I know of people who have struggled their whole life because when they were a kid, they made a profession of faith. They got saved. The whole church saw that they got saved. Everybody believes that they're saved their whole life. But as an adult, they are sitting there in a service about salvation saying, man, I have some doubts. I still don't know if I'd make it to heaven if I died today, but I don't want everybody to know because they already think I'm saved. People think I'm saved, so... I really can't say I'm not saved or go to somebody and talk to them because I'll disappoint them because they thought I was already saved. I've seen that many, many times. My wife was one of those people. I got married to my wife. I thought she was saved. She wasn't. Um, I thought she was saved. Soon after we got married, she was in church and she was listening to the pastor. It was a, it was a sermon about the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't one of those big, powerful salvation messages. But every time the preacher preached, she thought, I don't know where I'm going. Well, I, there's a chance. If I die today, I'm not going to heaven. So at 21 years old, my wife got saved. Because it, was, it didn't matter what anybody else thought anymore. It was about uh, the need for salvation. So if that's you this morning and you're like, well, everybody believes I'm saved. I've already thrown that out there and now they think I'm saved. I don't want to embarrass myself. Believe me, there's not one person in this crowd that would be disappointed at all if you got saved today and they already thought you were. But understand that that is, that is so true. Coming to God as a child is the only way to get there. It's the only way to get there. Any other attitude or mindset will fall short. Jesus is saying you've got to come as a child. You've got to come as a child. But it's not just the key to get in. It's also the key to your spiritual growth after you get saved. This is an important mindset. Even if you got saved with this kind of heart, you need to ask yourself, do I still have this kind of heart? Am I, do I still have that heart of a child? Do I still have that? I mean, I know that's how I got saved, but uh, no, I've matured since then. I've grown. Don't lose that heart of a child. Don't lose that because it's key not only to salvation, but it's, a, it's key to your spiritual growth. This is one of my favorite uh, illustrations of Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. I love this that Jesus pointed this out. He gets right to the point on this one. If you do not come with the heart of a child, you do not get in. It's, it's so important to come with the heart of a child. Then Jesus takes these kids in his arms and he blesses them. 
He blesses these children. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, this message will tell you exactly how you know you can. And if you've already accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, this message will tell you exactly how to proceed in your life with him. This is kind of a big deal. This is a big illustration that Jesus gives us here. Your inner child needs a little bit of free time. So I want to talk about that this morning. It's okay to let your inner child run the place. Let that guy out of there. Let him, let him run the place on this issue. Not all of you people are like, yeah, I'm going to the store and guess what I'm going to do. Not that, not that inner child. This inner child. Let's let them get a little bit of free time here. When a person gets saved, they don't get saved based on their own merits. You don't get saved because you were good enough. You're, you don't get saved because one day God looks at you and goes, yeah, I really need that one. They're so good. That's going to set a good example for my kingdom. They're so good, I'm going to save them. You don't get saved based on your own merits. It's all about how you approach the kingdom. When you were physically born, you received life. And you didn't have to earn it or work it for it. None of us did. My mind is a little bit foggy on that day, the day I was born. I was born at a really young age. So my memory doesn't serve me correctly on that day. It was a long time ago. But the day I was born, I didn't have to do anything to get that life. That life was a gift. I didn't have to earn that. I didn't have to work for that. That life was a gift. When you're born again spiritually, it happens the same way. That life is a gift also. It is a gift also. Physical life isn't something any of us choose. We're kind of, got, we're kind of thrown in the middle of that one. Okay, we're, we're just like, oh, great, I'm here. I guess I start now. We're, we're kind of thrown into the middle of the physical life thing. But spiritual life is only ours if we choose to receive it with the heart of a child. God says, now this one is up to you. You can choose or reject, but it is your choice. If you want me, accept me. If you don't want me, you can reject me. But you, the only way to get me is to come with the heart of a child. I, I want you to come with that childlike heart. If you think you're something because of your reputation or by the things that you've done for God, you're missing it. You're missing it. Yeah, I've done all these good things. I, I, God should be in favor of me. He should really like me, so I should be saved because look at all the good things I've done. Well, God does give us an illustration of that also. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. <clears throat> we never had a relationship. Yeah, you did all those things for me, but you can't earn your way to this one. You need, we need that relationship, and I never, I never knew you. We never had that relationship. Salvation doesn't happen when you've done enough to please God. It doesn't happen that way. It happens when you see yourself as someone who cannot do enough to make it on your own. And you say, catch me. That's, that's when salvation happens. When you realize, I can't do this on my own. I'm in, a, I'm in a situation, and I, I, God, would you catch me? It's like that kid that dad throws in the air, and they're freaked out while they're way up there. And as soon as they come down and dad catches them, what do they say? Do it again. Do it again. Why? Because I know you're going to catch me. The trust of a child. I'm going to put my fate in your hands. Do it again. Do it again. That's the heart of a child. That's, that's when you surrender and entrust him with your eternal destiny. Catch me. I can't do it on my own. I can't do I know. There's nothing I can do to earn it. There's nothing I can do to appease God because my sin is already enough to disqualify me. I can't have salvation based on anything I do. So I'm going to ask you to do me one favor, God. Catch me. Could you do it? Could you do it for me? And he's like, I've just been waiting. Go ahead, jump, jump. Let's do this. It's the heart of a child. You turn from your life of sin to a life with Christ. It's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. That's when salvation happens. 
You mean I can't be good enough? I can't do enough? Not a chance. If you could get to God, then God would not have come to us. But we couldn't get to God. And that's why God came down. That's why God came to us. This is the place where you realize that you're not strong enough and you need help. That's when salvation happens. When you realize, okay, <clears throat> I'm helpless. I'm helpless. I can't make it on my own. God, would you be willing to catch me? He's like, oh yeah, I've just been waiting. Go ahead and jump. Go ahead and jump. This is the heart that produces salvation. But after we receive that new life, something terrible happens. Brace yourself, here it comes. It's talking about all of us here. Something terrible happens after we receive that new life. <clears throat> we go into those really cool adolescent years. Yeah, the, that's when it gets fun right there. We, we start to grow. We go into those spiritual adolescent years. We start growing and learning new information. We're starting to grab it all. We're growing, we're learning, we are becoming intelligent. And we know it. We know it. We start taking our cues from our close friends and the other influences in our life. We're growing, we're learning, um, and we're starting to take our cues from other people's reactions, their response, what they say about us, how they treat us. We're taking our cues from other people. Our understanding becomes skewed. We had a relationship. Yeah, he caught me. Man, he, was, he caught me. He's, he's able to do that. And then we grow and get around people and in society and we mature-ish. And we get our understanding skewed. And we begin to see things through a distorted lens. The judgment and shame that we experience from others becomes the way we see God also. And that happens to all of us. A lot of times we go to church and we leave feeling shamed and we feel uh, that judgment on us. Uh, we hang around other people and they judge us or shame us. And somehow we associate that with God too. That's how God feels about me. Everybody else feels this way. God feels, must feel that way too. We begin to see ourselves as unworthy and unforgiven. We develop the need for constant spiritual daily cleansing in our mind. Every day you wake up, I'm still a dirty, rotten sinner. I'm still a dirty, rotten sinner. I need daily cleansing. I need daily cleansing. Sinner saved by grace is a common thing that we all throw out there. I'm a sinner saved by grace. In that case, you just put yourself in the sinner and saint category. All at the same time, I'm a sinner and a saint. How do you make that work? You're, I'm, a, I'm a perfectly washed as white as snow forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future. Jesus paid the entire thing on the cross. All the punishment for my sin was paid through Jesus Christ. I have been washed as white as snow, dirty, rotten sinner. How does that work? How does that work? But we start seeing ourselves that way. We develop the need for that, uh, that mindset that I need to be cleaned on a daily basis because I'm always unworthy. We're continually running back to God and asking him for more forgiveness. Could you forgive me for that one too? And I'm back. Could you forgive me for that one too? But the blood of Christ was already shed for us. The price was, for sin was already paid in full, 100%. God completely forgave you like he said he did. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. It says, by that will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We are forgiven 100%. God did something really cool for his kids. He, and if you are a child of God, he did something really cool for you. First, he made us his children, which that was awesome. Thank God for that because we couldn't do it on our own. Then he left a note on the refrigerator before he left for work. That's really awesome. You like when your kid, you wake up and there's a note left for you. That's a cool feeling. Dad left you a note on the refrigerator. Hey, I love you. I'm thinking about you today. That, that's cool. That, that's a cool feeling. Well, before God left for work, he put a note on the refrigerator for us. The Bible is that note. Just, you're like, well, I didn't see my note. The, the Bible, that's the note. This, it's an illustration. The Bible is that note and it's full of some pretty awesome stuff. He left you a letter. He left you a note. I took care of everything for you. You are completely forgiven, 100%. Don't live under that sense of condemnation anymore. We're good. We're good. Have a good day. 
washed white as snow. Let me show you that part of the note. I just like, did he really say that? Yeah, let me, I'm going to look at, open the note for you so you can see the note he left you. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Why do we live lives filled with shame when God provided freedom from that? You're good. You're good. I washed you as white as snow. You're good. You're good. We listen to other influences and we compare to God to the behaviors of other people. We start growing, we start reasoning, and we start seeing God in the light of how other people treat us. We begin to see God in a way that doesn't match his letter. I need more forgiveness. Well, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So if you need more forgiveness for sin, then we're going to need more shedding of blood. Or Jesus' sacrifice was complete. You don't need more forgiveness. You might need to stop what you're doing, but you don't need more forgiveness because he gave you plenty of forgiveness. Plenty of forgiveness. Just as teenagers often do, we begin to see ourselves as something we are not. And we, that low self-esteem happens and we start questioning ourselves. We understand that God has made us a new creation we have a new self. God has made us new. Just like the song we heard earlier, you have made me new. We understand that he has made us new, but we think that God wants us to deny ourselves after salvation, even though the Bible never teaches this. To deny yourself to get to salvation, that's one thing. But after you're saved, God never tells us to deny ourselves. I gave you a new self. Don't deny that. I made you new. You're a new person. You're a new creation. Don't deny that. Stay with that. Don't deny that. There's no daily cleansing. There's no uh, rituals. There's no special recipes you have to follow. You don't have to do all that stuff. We're good. Live like a child of God. You're a child of God. Act like one. That's it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Act like one. You're, you've been saved from all of that. Don't do that anymore. Act like the child of God that you are. Live that life. We don't need to try to appease God with our sacrifices. And uh, many times we're trying to do that because we don't feel good enough. We have that low self-esteem thing that happens. As we see the world around us move forward, we associate the characteristics of society with God. This is how God, society sees me. This is how society reacts. So we associate that with God's behavior also. God doesn't act like society. We don't have to associate the way other people treat us to what God, how God treats us, treats us and sees us. Everything in our spiritual walk gets muddied by outside influences. We, we, we let that happen. Even our giving becomes affected. Did you know that? Even the giving that you do, the, we put the money in the offering plate, we even let that get affected by the way that our, our judgment gets skewed. Do you remember as a kid when that offering plate came around? Those of you that grew up in church, remember when the offering plate came around and it's a coming and your pockets are empty? What do you do? You look to mom and dad. Like, hey, you got a quarter? You got a dollar? I only have a 20. That'll work. The offering plate's coming and I want to give. I want to put something in the offering plate. Please give me something because I want to throw it in the offering plate. You just wanted to give. You remember that feeling as a kid? I remember that. I robbed my parents on a regular basis. <laughs> hey, you got money? The plate's coming. Yeah, and they'd give me a quarter or a dollar. I remember one time, I think we even got up to a five. I was able to throw a $5 bill and I'm like, yes, I just wanted to give. I, I just, here it comes, and I want to give something. I just have nothing to give. I just want to give. Then we grew up, and we made things more complicated, didn't we? <clears throat> like, well, for one, money is really precious when you have to earn it yourself. A kid can give your money away all day long, and they don't mind that. But money becomes precious, and we hold on to it a little bit tighter. But we, we also made things a whole lot more complicated than that. We developed this idea that we have to give God a tithe or 10%. We, have, we, we feel like we have to do that. And if you think, like, well, hey, wait, I know that's in the Bible. Yes, it's in the Old Testament. It was something he set up for his people, Israel. And he did set that up. But did you know that if you were to ask a child to pick up the Bible and go ahead and start reading, they would never find this teaching in the New Testament at all? It's not in there. It, let me show you what they would find in the New Testament. This is really awesome. This is what they would find. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. But this I say... 
He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Give what you want out of your love for your heavenly Father. There's no religious requirements. When you give, do it because you love him. Do it because you love what he's doing through the church and you want to support that. That's the only thing I ask you to do. When you give, this is how I want you to do it. Cheerfully. Not of necessity. Not because somebody made you. Not grudgingly. Do it from your heart. That's how I want, it to do. I want you to do it. Do it like your kid does when they ask for your money. I just want to give something. I, I want to show my love and buy some. I have nothing to give. I just want to throw it in the offering plate. God says, that right there, that heart of a child thing, do it like that. I love that. I love that. Don't give out a necessity or obligation. Be that kid that's just excited to give. I love him. All I have is a 20. I love him that much past the 20. Let's do this. (laughs) I just want to give. The day you got saved, you realized that you were destined for an eternity without hope. In eternity without God. That's what happened the day you got saved. You realized, I can't do this on my own and I need him to catch me. I need some help here. That's, that's what happened the day you got saved. You all understood that you did not have the power to change the fact that you were lost. You, you could not do it. You were completely relying on God to help you. That's how we got saved. That's the only way a person can get saved is to come with the heart of a child. I can't do this. I need your help. You knew you needed him. You enter the kingdom of God when you realize it's got to be all him. It's got to be all him. If it was any of me, then he wouldn't have had to pay that price on the cross for me. It's all him. It's all him. This childlike mindset is extremely important. It's so important. But then Satan tries to get involved in an attempt to draw us away from that frame of mind. He gets us focused on our siblings. You remember that part of being a child? Actually, it might still be going on if you have siblings. You know how that works. Sibling rivalry is a real thing. It's a real thing. And usually done in fun. Fun for the person doing the attack. But you don't mind doing it to your sibling. If sibling rivalry is a real thing. It's the competition of a lifetime. You know, we're always going at it. We have that sibling rivalry going on. Many times it's all about outdoing or outshining the other person. That's what sibling rivalry is. Oh, your mom's favorite. We'll fix that. You know, it's all about outshining or outdoing the sibling. This works out pretty good for Satan's agenda, though. Really good. This is a perfect thing. If he can get us to see others as the problem, he can stunt our spiritual growth. You start focusing on others. Go ahead and focus on those other children of God. And we can stunt that spiritual growth. But we should take a minute and glance at that note that the Father gave us one more time. Remember that note on the refrigerator? That big giant book? Let's go ahead and look at that one more time. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's really simple. Go back and look at the note. Go back and look at the note. People are not the problem. People are not the problem. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not people. It's what Satan wants to accomplish by using people. That's the problem. It's that mindset we get into. But when we forget what the note said, It begins, or we begin to take things out on other people. We start to go after those siblings. We start attacking each other. Ah, man, the sibling rivalry gets set in motion, and we're locked in there, and like, ah, man, that person's my problem. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Go look at the note on the refrigerator. He left you a really big note. It's not that. It's not that. Don't let that competition begin to rise. It's time to outshine everybody else. You know that feeling. You know, if I, like if I were to tell you, hey, by the way, um, I got a key to your house. I'm going to meet you there after church. Some of you would go, oh, no. Somebody needs to change the lock. 
living room's not clean. You know, there's stuff on the counter. Uh, I don't feel like I don't feel like I want him to walk into the house before I get to the house because things are in disarray. And I don't want you to know that I don't have my perfect life. You, you know the feeling, right? I want you to believe that I've got it all made. Don't look behind the curtain. Don't look because it's all in disarray. And I have, I have things that are kind of messed up. We begin to develop a hypocritical lifestyle whether we realize it or not because we're trying to outshine other people. We want everybody to believe our life is what it's supposed to be. I don't have any flaws. There's no boo-boos. No, I don't have any imperfections. I'm good. And all the rest of us go, I don't know how, but I know that's not true. Because we all, we all have shortcomings. All of us. Your house might look exactly like my house right now. I don't want you coming to mine either. Because I've got my little curtain up. Don't come and look at my imperfections. It's not my fault I have children. Yeah. <laughs> Don't come in yet. Don't come in yet. We make sure our faults are never exposed, don't we? Just don't let anybody see our faults. We carry the image of having that perfect marriage or that perfect family when we know we could use some help. There's a lot of marriages out there where they're like, man, there's holes here, and I know that, but I can't talk to anybody because I don't want them to think that I don't have a perfect marriage going on. So I don't talk to anybody about any of it. We operate as if we've got it all going on. Well, on the inside, we feel broken sometimes. We're hiding. We're hiding everything. We try to wear that mask so people don't know that we're weak. We all know what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, yeah, we all, we've all been there. Well, let's go back and look at that note and see how God instructs us to activate that inner child again. Are you going through that feeling? Man, I don't want anybody to know about my, my life or whatever. Well, God says, hey, go back to the refrigerator. Go look at the note. And let's let that inner child go here. Let's, let's let him out again. Look at James chapter 5 and verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Sometimes we need a little help. Sometimes we could really use a hand here. We could really use some help. God tells us to go to each other and talk about our struggles. Talk with someone who's invested in helping you grow. Don't pick somebody who's not. You know, like, I want to tell you all about my shortcomings. Yeah, I knew it. Yeah, I always saw you that way. That's not the guy. Don't go to that guy. Go to the person who's invested in helping you grow. Go to someone who will pray with you and for you. Go to that person. Say, hey, I'm struggling here. Hey, you know what? Let me, let's pray. Let's pray. I'm, I'm praying for you. I want to help you grow. God says, go to each other. Go to each other. I gave you siblings. I gave you a lot of them. Lean on each other. Go ahead. Help each other grow. You know those times when that child can't open the pickle jar. You watch them. You know, they've, they've got it all. They're holding that pickle jar with one arm. They're turn, trying to turn it with the other. They set it on the stove or whatever. They're trying to do it. Then you see them walk through with a hammer. And you're like, okay, whoa. <laughs> you, they're, they're, they're trying to open the pickle jar. They want that thing open. You watch them work on it for a while, but they just don't have the strength to do it on their own. They just don't have the strength. Not one of us would look at them with disappointment if they couldn't open it. Not one of us would. I'm so ashamed of you. I thought you could do this by now. Not, not one of us would do that. Not one of us. What we would want them do, to do is ask for help. Hey, could you help me? This is a struggle bigger than I can take care of on my own. Could, could you help me? Well, sometimes our spiritual walk, in our spiritual walk, we struggle to open the pickle jar. Sometimes we just have some struggles. And we don't know how to do anything. We don't know how to fix it on our own. It's okay to let your inner child take a turn. It's okay to do that. It's okay to ask somebody for help. It's okay to be vulnerable. That's something I had to learn in my life too. It's okay to be vulnerable. I need help. Is your marriage broken? Uh, I just, I don't know what to say to him. I don't know what to say to her. I'm not getting through. You know that the whole thing talking to family can't counsel family. Just throw that out there. Go ahead, try to counsel your family member. Now, it's, it's amazing that we have a youth pastor 
and I can talk to Josh, I can talk to our youth pastor. Our youth pastor can go to our teen class and say exactly what I've said for years to my kids. And my kids are like, he's a genius. <laughs> he, he just, man, he's, it's the way he said it. I gave him the note. He just read the note that I wrote. And he read it and you're like, that guy's brilliant. He's got so much wisdom. A lot of times we don't hear it when it's close to the situation. We hear it outside of the situation. And God says, go ahead, take advantage of that. Go ahead. Lean on each other. Lean on each other. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to let your inner child take a turn. Hey, I can't open the pickle jar. Could you help me? It's okay. Let the inner child take a turn. We try so hard to be someone that others look up to. All of us like that. We want to be that person other people can look up to. We try to carry the image of somebody who's got it all together. We want that. There are people who know they are not saved but they are afraid what others will think if they find out that they're really not saved. There are people who are struggling in their relationships, but they don't want to ruin that picture-perfect family image that they have going on. They tried so hard to create that image. They don't want to ruin that. Some of us carry bitterness and hurt, but we don't want to talk with anyone about it because it will reveal the fact that we're weak in that area. We, we get it. We, we know these struggles really happen. We know they're out there. Well, let me let you want in on a little secret here. The heart of a child can benefit you so much in each one of those areas. Let that inner child take a turn. Go ahead and let that happen. It's okay to admit that you can't open the pickle jar. It's okay. It's okay to be vulnerable. I want to share a quick story about my daughter. She doesn't know I'm going to share this. She's sitting right there. She's looking at me. The fear is trembling. You know, she's, it's building right now. I want to share a story about my daughter, um, and then we'll close. In 2011, our daughter Kendall passed away. We lost, she lived for two and a half months. We lost, we lost our daughter. And Caroline, who was only four at the time, saw me crying in the dining room all by myself. I thought I was protected. I thought I was doing a good job behind the curtain so nobody knew I was weak. I thought I was, that's what I was doing. It, the light was off. I was in a dark dining room. I was crying in there. <clears throat> and I noticed that she saw me. I saw her walk by. She saw me, but then she kept going. She just kept walking. Caroline had this little pink blanket that looked like a glorified washcloth. I mean, it was, it was a small little thing. She called it her Dee Dee. It, uh, it said the word sweetie on it, and I think that might be what she was trying to say, but we've never, we've never cracked the code on that one. But she had this little pink ratty blanket that she called her Dee Dee. And seriously, it was like a glorified washcloth. It was, it was not a pretty thing. This was her most cherished possession in life. She loved that thing. She took it around her with her wherever she went. Wherever you saw Caroline, she was, where's your Dee Dee? And she'd have it right there with her. It was close. As I was trying to cry quietly in that dining room, I heard Caroline walk back into the room. And when I looked up, she was trying to give me that little pink blanket. Four years old, she gave that to me. And she said, this helps me when I'm sad. This is the heart God wants us to come to Him with. And this is the heart He wants us to take care of each other with. Let your inner child run the place. Look at this verse, Romans chapter 12 and verse 15. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Let your inner child run the place. Go ahead. Are you vulnerable? Because I'm vulnerable. Let's try to figure out this pickle jar situation together. But neither one of us had the strength on our own, but maybe together... Go look at the note on the refrigerator. Iron sharpens iron. That means so, so does a friend sharpen the countenance of their friend. God says, go to each other. 
Help each other. Restore each other. When you're crying quietly in the other room, hold on, I'll be right back. I've got a glorified washcloth. I just want you to know that I'm there for you. I can't help any more than this, but I'm praying for you and I love you. You know what that act did for me that day? It dried up my tears and I thanked God for the little girl that I had in that room with me. Not the little girl that I lost. I wasn't focused on that one. I was focused on the one who brought me a glorified washcloth. And my day was so much better because what she did decided to do was to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That inner child says, hey, this fixes it for me sometimes. You want to try it? I'm like, my goodness, that fixed it for me too. Thank you for the glorified washcloth. That was an amazing trick. I would not have chosen that. <laughs> but it was that heart of a child that repaired the situation for me. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to ask your Heavenly Father to hold you or to catch you. It's okay. It's okay to go to your Christian sibling and ask for prayer when you are struggling. It's all right. It's okay to do that. It's okay to let your inner child run the place. It's all right. Now I'm going to ask a question here. I'm, I'm hoping everybody's listening and then we're going to close here. Maybe you are that person who understands that everybody else in this room believes you're saved. But you are struggling, even within yourself, saying, you know what? I have a doubt. I've got this small doubt that maybe I'm not saved. But I don't want everybody to know. <laughs> Believe me, everybody would rejoice with you if you got saved today. If you took care of that doubt, if you got saved today. This place would be, uh, there would be celebration for that. We want that for you. Maybe you're in a situation where you're struggling in life and say, I can't lean on anybody else because I don't want them to know I have the problem. Go to the refrigerator and take a look at the note. Go ahead. Bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Iron sharpens iron. It's okay. Go talk. Choose somebody who's a wise choice to talk to. But go ahead. Share it. Talk. Let your inner child run the place. Go ahead. Jesus' illustration about the children. The children are coming to Jesus and he goes, oh, hold on. I'm going to cash in on this illustration right here. That is a beautiful relationship. And I want to talk about that relationship. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let your inner child run the place. I promise you that's an exciting life. When you see chocolate or food on somebody else's shirt, you're not judging them because you know you got it on yours too. You know, I got problems too. The hamburger's this big. I'm going to try to figure it out, but I'm going to have ketchup right here when I'm done. And I'm not going to judge you if you have ketchup there either because we're all just people. We all struggle. We're all growing together, but we have a fa Heavenly Father who will catch us. We have a Heavenly Father who loves us. He can handle this. We don't have to judge each other. We, don't have, we can get up and grab a microphone. We don't worry about our tone. We don't worry about our pitch. We don't worry about what key we're in. We might not even be completely worried about all the words. But we're going to sing it to the Lord. Because I want to do that. I love Him, so I'm just going to let it go. Let your inner child run the place. It's a good life. It's a good life. Let that kid go.